And I think what is priced into markets right now is not just a soft landing, but it, you know we've we've migrated more towards potentially a no landing. Um, people have talked about a Goldilocks economy. I've even heard mention of a platinum locks <laughs> economy, <laughs> which is, you know I, I only imagine that's better than Goldilocks. Um, but uh, it's basically you know markets have come around to this idea that the economy is going to remain relatively strong. And inflation is going to come back down to the Fed's target, allowing for for rate cuts. You know, bullish, uh, bullish uh, rate cuts. Now, I think that's what's priced in. What I think we're headed towards, actually, what's happening in reality, is much more of a stagflationary type of a, a, a scenario than a soft landing or even a no landing scenario. Welcome to Thoughtful Money. I'm its founder and your host, Adam Taggart. Today's guest expert is concerned that too many investors, giddy with the ferocious market gains since November, are increasingly willing to pay prices for assets that only make sense if the pace of gains continues into the far future. This is called extrapolating the unsustainable, and it's a hallmark of late stage price meltups. Historically, this behavior hasn't ended well for those engaging in it. Will it prove any different this time? To find out, as well as hear his outlook for markets, we're fortunate to speak today with Jesse Felder, founder and editor of the respected market research firm, The Felder Report. Jesse, thanks so much for joining us today. Adam, great to be with you. Thanks for having me. Total pleasure, Jesse. I think you're one of the few so far uh, to uh, be appearing for a second time on this channel, a uh, new channel, but we've been around enough that that you're back on here. Um, always love it when you join. Thank you so much for for coming back on. Um, I uh, yeah, I, I, I pulled you in here because the markets have been on such a ferocious tear now um, that uh, I think there's some very valid questions being raised about the sustainability of the rally, uh, but just also correction risk, and these things tend to end with. The least sophisticated people jumping in right at the end, who are the ones that typically get burned the most, and they're the ones that can afford to lose the least. So I want to dive into all this with you. Real quickly, before we get into the specifics of that, though, let's just kick this off with the general question I ask you whenever you come on. What's your current assessment of the global markets, uh, the global economy and financial markets? Yeah, well, I think my assessment, uh, you know, I always like to look at, I think, reality versus what's priced in. And I think what is priced into markets right now is not just a soft landing, but it, you know we've, we've migrated more towards potentially a no landing. Um, people have talked about a Goldilocks economy. I've even heard mention of a platinum locks <laughs> economy, <laughs> which is, you know, I, I only imagine that's better than Goldilocks. Um, but uh, it's basically, you know, markets have come around to this idea that the economy is going to remain relatively strong and inflation is going to come back down to the fed's target allowing for for rate cuts you know bullish uh bullish uh, rate cuts now i think that's what's priced in what i think we're headed towards actually what's happening in reality is much more of a stagflationary type of a a, a scenario than a soft landing or even a no landing scenario and so that would be something where growth real growth continues to slow potentially turns negative but Nominal GDP growth may remain relatively strong. I think a lot of people don't necessarily know that in the 1970s, nominal GDP growth never slowed below 5% year over year. So it stayed in, nom in nominal terms, the economy continued to grow. It was just that we saw inflation you know, pick up in these waves that, that uh, uh, overcame the amount of nominal growth in the economy, resulting in uh, negative real growth. Um, I think, you know, that would also, you know, be part of that stagflationary scenario, right? So you have kind of slowing growth in the economy, a resurgence of inflation. At the same time, you, you still you start to see kind of a, a deterioration in the labor market. So we see the unemployment rate continue to kind of trend higher and things that point to <clears throat> a real landing in the economy. That's something harder than than what's priced in. All right. Um, I love that term, platinum locks economy. Um, I hadn't heard it before. I'm, I'm definitely stealing it. Um, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll ask if if some of these um, asset prices haven't gotten up in the the price to fantasy level. Um, but I like 
I like the term platinum locks economy better than price to fantasy. Um, <laughs> all right. So, so stagflation, I appreciate how you, um, you differentiate sort of how you would categorize or, or, or what, 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 uh, you know, what would, would, uh, suffice or, or, or qualify as, as a slow growth economy where you're set, you're really looking at real growth, not, not nominal growth. Um, Okay, so but I, really I think you know a lot of people. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, go think, ahead. You know, when you talk, when people are forecasting a recession, they're talking about you know what's in our minds is kind of the COVID crash or the the great financial crisis because those are kind of the last two recessions that we remember, where um, you know nominal GDP. I mean, the economy was just trashed, right? And it, it felt like it felt like that. I think you know if you're forecasting a recession today, it doesn't necessarily need to look anything like that. It can, you know, you can still have an economy that is not growing still in nominal terms, but is technically in recession because unemployment's going up and inflation, you know, eats away those those uh, nominal uh, that nominal growth um, and then some. And so I think that you know, when you know, we we may not get uh, that type of recession that uh, everybody is is you know was worried about a year ago. Let me put it that way. Um, that you know we're going to see another uh, financial crisis type of real painful dip uh, in the economy it could be more of a kind of a slow burn stagflationary type of a thing um, like we saw a half century ago. Well, and I think what's important about that is um, it, it, it. I think it has some explanatory power for the world that I think an increasing number of people find themselves in, where they're like, "All right, the headlines are all good, but I <laughs> don't feel good." <laughs> right. right. Like, why am I miserable when I'm being told how great everything is because GDP is at X or unemployment rates at Y or whatever, right? Or inflation's at Z. Um, and you're basically saying, you know, what matters is sort of the real calculation of all that. And so we we may we may go through a period where there is nominal GDP growth, where there is um not rampant unemployment like we see in a lot of traditional recessions, but it still may feel pretty painful. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's probably, you know, if we do go into recession, and I think we will this year, and I was wrong, I thought I expected we'd have one in the second half of last year. Um, I do think, you know, it, it will eventually come this year, but it will more likely look like that than than kind of what people think about when you use the word recession right now. Okay. Um, it's, I, it's, I think it's a really important point you brought up here, and I want to help make sure that sticks in people's minds as we as we look forward to the rest of the year. Um, but a lot of that is predicated on what happens with inflation. So I'd love to get a sense for your inflation outlook. And I'll, I'll proceed your answer just by saying, um, I, I think that is the point at which I see the greatest differentiation and outlooks for the folks that I interview on this channel. Um, there's a lot of other things where there's much greater consensus on, but I can I can point to a bunch of smart people who think inflation's going below 2% and maybe we've got to worry about deflation at some point over the next year. And I got a lot of other people who say, no, it's definitely sticky or, or secularly going even higher over the next couple of years. So where do you see things? Well, I mean, I, first to, I guess, qualify my comments here. I'm not an economist. I'm not, I don't even consider myself a macro uh, economics expert um, by any stretch. But I do think there's some dynamics that are going on in the world economy that you don't need to be an economist to understand. Um, there's a great book, The Demographic Reversal. The Great Demographic Reversal came out a couple of years ago talking about how demographics globally is shifting uh, in a way that uh, is, is creating a secular shift in inflation, right? We had um, uh, a population boom that resulted in a, in a basically a supply shock in labor markets where, you know, baby boomers came into the labor market and you had um, too many people and, uh, you know, not enough jobs. And that allowed for the destruction of labor unions and all these kinds of right. things. And combined, combined with, with the, obviously. <laughs> yeah, obviously with the, the, the offshoring of labor. And which is another, you know, that deglobalization um, is, is another dynamic here. But simply, if you just look at de demographics, the shrinking workforce relative to the overall size of the population puts a great deal of uh, strain on a, on a smaller group of people, which is going to support wage growth and things like that for, for a long time to come. And sh the, sh the shift 
from capital to labor, I think, is happening. And that's that's a uh, an inflationary force going forward. But you combine that, like you, you mentioned, with this trend from globalization, which also re represented another supply shock in the labor force, right? We could all of a sudden uh, tap the production of, you know, goods and things in places like China where people were uh, moving, you know, out of uh, rural areas into the cities and manufacturing and all these things created, that was a huge disinflationary force as well. That's now going into reverse uh, in terms of the reshoring of labor and, uh, you know, bringing production back home. Um, those two forces, I think, are really, really important secular forces for uh, inflation going forward um, that are going to, uh, I think, prevent uh, inflation from coming back down anywhere near the levels that uh, people got used to over the last 10, 20 years. So, you know, there's you have those secular dynamics on top of cyclical, cyclical things like the massive money printing and things that we saw in the wake of COVID, which really exacerbated the inflationary pressures. Right. We saw, you know, tightening a monetary policy that helped bring that inflation back under control. But the money, you know, the, the money supply, as you know, you and Tavi Costa were talking about on Twitter mm -hmm. today, is growing again. And so, you know, you have this these cyclical dynamics going on with the money supply that add to kind of these secular forces. And I think together, they're now all pointing to, uh, a, a, you know, a return of inflation and a pickup in inflation pressures before we even get near the Fed's achieving its target. Okay. Let, let me just put one qualifier in there. Um, the monetary base is uh, increasing again pretty dramatically. The money supply isn't. Um, right. M2 actually, is not, but yeah, bank reserves are. Yeah, yeah. because bank reserves are in the base, but not in my supply. And the reason why I make that differentiation is, is Lacey Hunt is one of those who's much more concerned in the near term about disinflation and eventual deflation because of the decline in the money supply. That's kind of his whole thing. Same thing with Steve Hankey, actually, who I just interviewed as well. Yeah. Uh, because the money supply is one of the factors that goes into the quantity theory of money equation. This is the thing that Steve Hankey really looks at. Um, okay, but basically what I hear from you saying is, is you, you feel that um, uh, is, from your perch, uh, better to bet on, on sticky at a minimum inflation from here. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I think there's just too many things pointing to that. I mean, I talked about the first two Ds, demographics and deglobalization. I think the rapid growth in the debt is another thing supporting inflation. And then I think we also have a, we now have just very recently, it's been become more clear that we have a central bank that's demurring from its uh, its uh, stable prices mandate, right? We've got a central bank that's still talking about rate cuts, even when at the time when inflation numbers are coming in hot. I think it's very clear that the Fed is, is uh, is not committed uh, to its, you know, achieving its two percent mandate in the way that J. Powell wanted us to believe, even you know, six or six or twelve months ago, um, you know, when he kept re reaffirming that uh, you know they are going to do whatever it takes to bring inflation back down. That all of that language is gone. <laughs> inflation surprising to the update upside, and they're still talking about rate cuts. So that to me is the fourth D is the, is the central bank that's demurring from its. Uh, from its its inflation mandate, and so when you put all those things together, to me, it's I I think it's it's overwhelming evidence that uh, inflation is going to remain elevated relative to recent history. Okay, so uh, so so you as you look out in terms of your market forecasts and all that stuff, you, you're taking that higher uh, higher for longer inflation into account. <laughs> oh, Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. Okay, great. Uh, just because you mentioned it, let me let me just slip this question in. Um, uh, do you believe that we are in an era of fiscal dominance right now? And, you know, a characteristic of fiscal dominance is absolutely the, the central bank basically has to abandon its its inflation concerns because it just has to focus on servicing the debt. Absolutely. And if you look at this is something I've been writing about actually for several years now. Just look at the trajectory of federal debt to GDP and the Fed's balance sheet relative to GDP. 
and they move almost perfectly in sync. There are times when the Fed has try has tried to alter the course of its of its balance sheet relative to the federal debt, but that's when we run into problems. That's when we see things like the repo fiasco of 2019. Is and and I think that's what the Fed is worried about again today. Is we cannot maintain quantitative tightening. We cannot maintain these higher interest rates without causing real problems um, in in the treasury market and for for potentially for the the federal government uh, in terms of debt servicing. So, I mean, you look at just the trajectory of interest expense, the, the you know, uh, forecasts, and I mean, they're assuming, you know, interest rates come back down to, you know, two, three uh, percent. If interest expense doesn't come down, you know, interest rates don't come down rapidly. The forecast for interest expense alone on the debt um, is is much more uh, significant, more dramatic to the upside um, than it is currently. So, yeah, I, I think we're in I think the the the, the clearest evidence that we've we're in a, 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 t- a period of fiscal dominance and we have been is just that the Fed's balance sheet to GDP is closely mirroring the federal debt to GDP. That the, the Fed is 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 uh, following in the in the footsteps of the trajectory of the federal debt, and it just has to. Okay, so I am working my way to your your market overview, but um, one maybe a last macro question here. Um, so, uh, you, you, you you talked about the higher that rates stay stay here, the more damage they could do to the economy. Um, you know, this goes right into the whole lag effect debate, which been, you know, keeping alive on this channel. Um, to your point, like if you look at the markets right now, this platinum locks economy, you know, basically says, hey, no lag effect here, right? You know, Fed hiked rates more aggressively than it ever has while doing Q2 at the same time. And we're getting a hall pass, right? The, the, the economy is going to be just fine, right? Um, yeah we can we can have the debate as to whether the fed can ride to the rescue enough in time with rate cuts uh to try to help corporate america and american households from the the maturity wall that that they're both facing but i'm just curious do, do you think that we can get through this without having any real deleterious effects uh from the higher rates uh and of course if rates go down the national interest will will, will come back down a bit um, or uh, do you expect a lag effect to manifest um, at some point? It's just traveling on its way through time to us. Yeah, I, I, I think the lag effect is still there. It's just that, uh, you know, when interest rates went so low in 2020 and into early 2021, corporations refinanced in a massive way. Um, everybody did, except for the treasury, right? Uh, you know, we, we, we had uh, people refinancing their mortgage below 3%. And, and so now you have a housing market, you know, that's the haves and the have nots, right? The haves of yep. the people locked in a sub 3% mortgage. And, you know, I mean, they're looking, they're sitting pretty with real estate prices continuing to move higher and their mortgage costs locked in. And then people who are, you know, out on the outside looking in saying, okay, well, seven, it's seven percent now and prices are higher. Like this is ridiculous. Why would I, you know, I there's it makes no sense to to buy a house in in, in under this scenario. Uh, but over time, right, people are 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 forced to move and uh you know, and and co- companies are forced to refinance their debt at higher interest rates. So, I mean, I, I think that's one of the things. If you just think about, you know, the I, I've seen some research that that shows the the number one. I mean, corporate profit margins are at record highs. The number one thing that's driven that is interest rates. Interest rates falling to record lows. So you got to think that if interest rates are not going to go back to their lows and they're going to remain at it, you know, I mean, even I think that, you know, uh, Bond Bulls and, and even, you know, Jay Powell said interest rates are probably not going to go back down to where they were right. pre-pandemic. So even if they do come down, they're going to be more elevated than they were in the past. And that is that is a very important, uh, uh, I guess, reversal for the, the the thing that supported corporate profit margins over the past several decades. So that that you know like I said so many companies re, uh, refinance debt at record low interest rates that you know they've got those locked in for a time but as as you suggest that maturity wall 
gets closer, companies are forced to, to refinance. That's going to pressure, you know, profit margins and things. And uh, it will have a, have an effect. It's just I think the lag effect has been extended because the, that massive refinancing in 2020, 2021 it allowed it to be pushed out further. Yeah, it bought time. Okay. Yeah. But that time is ticking, right? I think it's close to a trillion in corporate debt that that comes up for renewal this year and then more than that next year and then more than that the following. And there's a lot of there's a lot of, you know, extending and pretending going on right now too, right? I mean, look at, you know, commercial real estate in the office world, right? Uh, if if everybody had to reprice their office portfolios at market values today, we'd be in a financial crisis, right? right? We would be in one. If private equity had to, uh, you know, reprice every th their portfolios at market value today at today's discount rates right. and things, we'd be in a we'd be in a financial crisis right, right which, now. Which would also we'd be in a pension crisis too because they hold. At, it. So. Yes, and so a lot of these things are are already problematic, but they're just they they take time to play out, and so I think that the further you know we go with interest rates at current levels. The more they're going to play out, the more we're going to start to see these types of things become problematic. So I would think then, um, you know, an AI revolution aside that just creates gobs and gobs of of, uh, of, of new incremental value. Um, looking out of the next decade, you are probably expecting markets to perform less well than they did over, say, the previous decade or two simply just for the reason of, of higher uh, interest rates, right? If you yeah, expect I mean, higher I... inflation, you expect higher interest rates, that just, that's going to slow the economy a bit. It's going to increase the cost of capital for companies. There's just going to be less, correct? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, let's differentiate markets, right? I, I think that financial, prices of financial assets, yes, are going to perform uh, a lot worse than they have over the last 10, 15 years. Stocks and bond prices, um, namely, um, real assets and commodities, probably in a higher inflation environment. I mean, th these things are so dramatically underowned by institutional investors right now, and they are by far the best things to own to protect yourself during a, you know, a period of elevated inflation. That I think um, you know we are in, uh, and I've been saying this for several years now, we're in the early innings still of, a, of a, another commodity super cycle. Um, and so owning things like, um, you know, energy stocks and uh, precious metals and, and miners and things like this, uh, I think are going to be the, 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 the asset markets that do very well over the coming five, 10 years, uh, while financial assets um, you know, performance uh, is is going to disappoint relative to the expectations they've created over the last ten years. Okay. Um, all right. So we're gonna we're gonna dive into all that. I think that's probably going to be the heart of this discussion. Um, real quickly, before we get to the opportunity offered by hard assets, um, let's get back to, to you know pricing the fantasy right here. Yeah. Um, so in the intro, I mentioned this term that, that you've been writing about. I don't know if you coined it or for somebody else, but this extrapolating the unsustainable. So they're I'm looking- i to give credit to Eric Cinnamon. Um, he's, he's, you know, good friend of mine, um, small small cap manager uh, and, you know, just brilliant guy. But he he wrote a piece last week uh, talking about, you know, that's that's what happens pretty much in every, every bubble. And we're seeing it today. Uh, with AI and in valuations across the board, really, in, in the stock market. Okay. And so this this is basically just investors looking at the current rate of gains in stocks, the current, um, you know, maybe it's inflation coming down. So they're extrapolating, okay, we're going to be under 2%, you know, or down at 2% soon. There's They're just projecting all these trends and then assuming they're going to continue basically ad infinitum where you've already identified several where you think, no, actually it's it's gonna be quite different than what the recent past suggests. And so people obviously are, are pulling what I would call maybe phantom value into today's prices, value that's just highly likely not gonna materialize in the future because those trends aren't gonna continue at infinitum. You're nodding as I'm saying all this. 
Absolutely. You know, I, and I think that, you know, you mentioned the AI, uh, you know, sector. Um, I, I think it's it's probably a really good um, example of this dynamic, right? Uh, investors, I think, you know, as my friend Fred Hickey has pointed out, the semiconductor space, the history of NVIDIA, the history of Micron, the history of a lot of these companies that are that are seeing their stock prices go through the roof recently is a history of boom and bust. Right. They've they've never gone through a, a cycle where they saw rapid growth that just persisted for years and years. Right. They see rapid growth and that rapid growth is usually driven by, you know, product cycle. Right. A new product comes out. Everybody needs to get on the bandwagon. And so we're going to order tons of semiconductors to make this happen. And you get double, triple ordering. Right. And then demand starts to slow down and actually demand crashes because everyone's doubled and tripled order ordered and now now we don't need to now the semiconductors don't need to produce any because the market is flooded with product and so everything goes in the toilet that's the history of these companies right but what are investors doing once again once again they're looking at this as if this growth that we've seen over the last 12 18 24 months is literally going to persist indefinitely that's that's extrapolating the unsustainable right it's the definition of a bubble and I, that's exactly what's going on in stock prices of NVIDIA and Micron and, you know, a lot of these different names. Um, it's the reason why historically these stocks have literally at the top, they've traded typically like eight or 10 times earnings, right? Not 30, 40, 50 times earnings because <laughs> analysts know that, okay, we're only going to pay six or eight times earnings at the top because earnings are going to crash. We, we know this, right? This is what happens every time. So if you're paying six or eight times at the top and then earnings crash, okay, well, the pain's not going to be too bad because you only paid six times earnings. But when you pay 30, 40, 50 times earnings for a stock whose, whose earnings are going to crash inevitably, when the double, triple ordering, you know, becomes a real problem as demand begins to fall, um, you know, it can be extraordinarily painful. And yeah. I think there's already signs that the demand for AI is is beginning to to falter in a, in a meaningful way. All right, and I just want to make sure I I, I was hearing you correctly because you were talking about earnings, but stocks like Nvidia are at thirty to forty times sales. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, it's it's insane. I mean, I, I think the forward the forward price earnings multiple, which yeah, on it is in in the thirties. Yeah, I, the semiconductor index. I think the SOX trades at a forward price earnings ratio of forty. Never, never has that, that has that happened before because it's a boom bust industry. And so, you know, as I mentioned, I think we're starting to see some faltering demand for some of these, um, you know, AI. Uh, I mean, namely the like, large language models and things that they're building with this. But I think one of the things that I would just point out is that over the last um, several months, the AI industry, Sequoia pointed this out. The AI industry spent $50 billion on NVIDIA chips. And so far, they've brought in $3 billion of revenue on that $50 billion of CapEx. So if they can't find a way to monetize this stuff rapidly, then it's going to cut, you know, it's going to be a really big, big problem for these companies. Now, another venture capitalist, Bill, Bill Gurley, pointed out that the, the, the prices that uh, people are, are, are uh, open AI and things are asking for use of these large language models is, is now dropping dramatically, right? The older versions of ChatGPT, you know, if you want to license the, you know, the underlying technology, it's like literally plunging. And that's because uh, that the, the demand obviously is just not, not there for, for these things. And so the, the capital investment has been extraordinary. The revenue generation has not appeared. And so what we're starting to see now is uh, that it's, that a, a lot of this is falling off. And there were a couple of surveys of Fortune 100 companies to, you know, to Fortune 1000 companies that showed I think 98% of chief, chief technology officers are scaling back uh, or, or holding off completely on even investing in AI at all out of um, you know, concerns about uh, legal ramifications, um, the errors that can happen um, and security risks. And so, you know, this is early days and, and this is the history of these early technologies. It's just like we saw with the internet, right? You have this huge hype cycle. 
huge boom in investment. That boom creates a, you know, uh, it, I mean, sows the seeds of its own demise. Um, when you have too much capital flowing in, returns plunge. And that's what we saw with the internet. And then it takes years and years to figure out, okay, what are the best uses for this new technology that we can, you know, monetize and create productivity for, for, for clients? That's way down the road for AI. We're, we're just not there yet. Um, and so I think we're at this stage now where the hype cycle is starting to give way to um, the reality of monetizing AI is going to be much more difficult than um, markets have currently priced in. Yeah, and that's that's what the sort of price to fantasy gets you, right? Which is you don't need a terrible quarter to shift sentiment, to crater sentiment. You just need a quarter that's not unbelievably better than everybody expected, right? It's it's a it's a great point because when you when you look at the growth that's being discounted, right? Um, if you just decelerate that growth just a little bit, the present value of that of that asset declines dramatically. If you just assume instead of a 30% growth rate indefinitely, we're going to assume a 20%, right? The present value drops drops like a stone if you come back down to 10% growth rate or 5% growth. I mean, right, you're talking about, you know, 70, 80, 90% declines in the present value of something when the growth rate decelerates to that that degree. Now, we could be in a, in a scenario where you see uh, you know, demand for these LLMs and things like this, you know, if it's true, 98% of CTOs are saying, stop, hold off, we can't roll this out, we're too worried about, you know, security risks and legal liabilities, um, you know, demand could, I mean, growth could not drop from 30 to 20 to 10, it could turn negative. And in that case, then you're looking at some real pain for, for a lot of these uh, stock prices that have discounted, you know, like you said, a, a fantastical future. Well, so he, here's where I'm going with this. Um, and, and I've got some other issues here about AI flags that have been raised that I'll, I'll add in just a second. But so much of what's been powering the markets out of the doldrums of the end of 2022, right, besides a bunch of rising net liquidity, um, has been the AI, you know, hype, right, um, or AI promise. Um, and we've had the magnificence, you know, the, the, all of a sudden the Fang complex got renamed the Magnificent Seven, and they have been powering the market higher since. And of course, none as as visibly as Nvidia, right? Uh, and largely through that time, the the market breadth got narrower and narrower. Um, but but these AI stocks or the stocks that have seen the biggest boom in, in their prices due to AI, so Nvidia, but Microsoft and Google and, and all the other players and, and it, big players in the AI space, you know, they are extremely over-owned, um, or, I, or I should say they are some of the most widely owned stocks. They are the most widely owned stocks. And so they're in, you know, a huge amount of ETFs that are out there. My point is, is so go the valuation of those stocks, so go the general markets, Right. So you have to care about this, even if you're not following AI and you think you're you're sitting that party out. Chances are, if you're in ETFs or just in these popular Mag7 stocks or whatever, like, you know, you're exposed to them. And oh, yeah. we could see that same dynamic just in reverse where, you know, let's say the, the, the other 493 stocks in the S&P don't change at all. But those seven guys get cut by some material percentage it's going to drag all the indices down with them. Absolutely. And I, I think what a lot of people don't necessarily appreciate is if you take that Magnificent Seven, which, which I mean, essentially are the indexes these days, as you point out, um, aggregate all their market caps and aggregate all their free cash flow. As a group, they trade 50 times free cash flow. Right. Wow. What what is that? I mean, what is that price in? That price is it right? What what how do you justify 50 times free cash flow? Well, you have to have massive amount of free cash flow flow growth in order to justify that type of a multiple. Right. So how do you get massive free cash flow growth? Well, AI, all this capital investment that they're putting in uh has has to pay off. Um, and so far, like I said, there's been no, almost no revenue generated by any of this AI stuff. So if it doesn't pay off, then that multiple is going to prove to be wildly optimistic. And so what's a fair price for, for these MAG7 stocks? Is it 25 times free cash flow? 
If so, I mean, prices have to come down 50%. That's that's how that how that math works. And so, uh, you know, 50 times free cash flow, um, you know, it's just, it, it is that price to fantasy that you're talking about. This is the highest valuation, essentially, that these stocks have traded at, at you know, in the history of their, since they, since Facebook, you know, Meta came, came public. Um, there's a couple other 50s I want to point out, though, while I'm at the topic, uh, on the topic, 50 times free cash flow. We've had 50 Titanic syndromes triggered across the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ over the last 12 months. You talk about the breath, breath problem. Well, that's it quantified. A Titanic syndrome is just when you have the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ composite within a few days of a record high and the number of lows is rising above a certain threshold. So at the same time you have the indexes making a new high, you have a bunch of stocks making new lows. That's that's not healthy. That's a breath warning. The only time we've seen 50 Titanic syndromes over a 12 month period across both indexes is at major market peaks. Mm. I don't even think we got to 50 in prior to the great financial crisis, but we did back in the in the 90s and uh, again pre pre 2020 um, 2020 or sorry the 2022 bear market. So then you have um, a 50 times insider sell to buy ratio, right? This is $50 are being sold among corporate insiders for every dollar being purchased. This is the highest reading in the history of, of my data that goes back to 2012. It's a fact, it's not my data, it's my friend Asif Surya's data who runs insidearbitrage.com. Great website, happy to plug it. But insider activity is something I've followed for my entire career. Because when you find stocks that are cheap and insiders are buying and validating that idea, it can be very, very valuable. But by the same token, um, when in aggregate, when you look at insider activity, uh, the only time we've gotten close to 50 uh, was over the past you know, 12 years of, in this data was in uh, November of 2021, we hit a, a ratio of 38. Um, and that was a very clear sign that insiders uh, were, were turning very bearish on the stock market. It was only a couple months later, the market reversed and in, in, into that 2022 bear market. So you take a 50 times cash flow, for the Magnificent Seven, 50 Titanic syndromes across the New York Stock Exchange and, and, the, and the NASDAQ over the last 12 months, and then a 50 times in insider sell to buy ratio. And to me, this is you know a very, very dangerous equity environment. Wow, those are... Um hair raising kind of mind blowing um uh funny i i, I had actually hadn't heard of a titanic syndrome i'd heard about the the hindenburg uh, it's very similar to the hindenburg like, omen yeah, yeah i track both <laughs> yeah um so anyways it's cool to learn about a new one although it's scary to hear that it's, it's happening right now like that um but i got to tell you the one that just fries my my neurons is the 50 times insider sales to buy ratio i mean yeah. I, I think you can you hear something like that, you don't even, you don't need any more data, right? You're just like, oh, okay, everybody who knows something is getting out, right? That should tell you, tell us everything we need to know. <laughs> well, and it's 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 a function of the selling and buying. So there's a lot of selling going on, right? And I think Bloomberg's been on top of Jeff Bezos's, you know, sells. He's been selling heavily for the first time, really since 2021. We have Mark Zuckerberg, you know, lots of these guys. Um, Jamie Dimon selling for the first time in his career, significant amounts of J.P. Morgan stock. But it's the it's the buying too. It's the lack of buying that that is something that I I think is just as important because I look back and we've only literally had I think in the last twelve months of the data only three and a half um, billion dollars of total um, insider buys and that's the lowest twelve month total I've seen in in the data. So not even don't even adjust that for market cap, right? Insiders are not buying at all. There's zero interest in buying today, and you have a lot of these guys liquidating like they haven't done, um, except for that 2021 time period, right? Which preceded a substantial market turndown. So, um, okay. Um, yeah, uh, it's funny. I just, uh, I had a video out a few days ago, uh, Jesse on kind of, you know, what the bears are missing, you know, had Ed Yardini on to kind of give a, a cogent bullish case, which he did. Um, but man, I wish I'd had that stat just to ask his, uh, <laughs> his, his opinion of, because that's a pretty hard, uh, warning sign to, to refute. Well, um, a lot of people say insiders sell, you know, for buy for only one reason, they sell for multiple reasons. But when you aggregate the data, 
Um, you know, there are all st kinds of studies that show <clears throat> Insider activity and that sell to buy ratio specifically is a really good leading indicator of not just what the stock market will do over the next 12 months, but what the economy will do over the next mm -hmm. 12 months. So it's not just a bear showman about, okay, stock prices are maybe overvalued, but obviously, I mean, insiders just, you know, only sell massively if they think that you know, maybe analyst estimates are too high. They're not going to meet revenue numbers. And these are the types of things we're seeing, right? Tesla had its, had its worst miss in the history of the company today in terms of, uh, you know, deliveries. Um, we're starting to see that in, in some of the earnings. And if, and if insiders are right, that's a new, you know, probably just the start of a new trend of disappointing uh, earnings and, and uh, revenue. Okay. Well, just to, just to finish up here on the AI thing, um, uh, I think I actually took this quote from uh, either your Twitter, I think it was from your Twitter, uh, where Gary Marcus says um, that if nobody, OpenAI, Google, or anyone else releases a true quantum leap by the end of 2024, substantially addressing the key issues around reliability, hallucination, data leakage, and security, uh, the bubble may start to pop by this time next year. So, you know, obviously it's sounding like that plus your the previous data points you mentioned, which is it's just showing there's this increasing sense of like, all right, we've taken the hype at face value up until now, but but now the rubber has to really start meeting the road and we're not making the revenues to justify this yet. And we're still seeing a lot of bugginess in the product at this stage where we're beginning to scratch our heads and say, well, wait a minute, you know, maybe we shouldn't just be buying this blindly hand over fist. Um, and, and let me ask you this. Um, uh, a quote again from, I think, might have been from your Twitter. Uh, Ever more powerful systems require larger oceans of information to learn from. This is talking about AI, right? Sort of an arms race for information. That demand is straining the available pool of quality public data online at the same time that some data owners are blocking access to AI companies. And here's my question. So right now, everyone's trying to get big pools of content to train their AI on. And that's the whole thing behind the Reddit IPO. And I've, I've talked about that with several people on this program to say that, you know, uh, I, I think AI has kind of been a godsend for the Reddit shareholders. And I think they're happy to get out and dump, you know, uh, what was a hard to monetize property uh, on these new AI enthused investors. And, and I think there's a can make a pretty good argument that that today's investors in that IPO are going to be disappointed in the future. And and this question I sort of have around Reddit, I think, is is a larger question for all of AI, which is what happens once all the big pools are tapped? Right? There's, there's only a finite amount of big pools out there. They're they're all going to get tapped relatively quickly. What happens after that? Yeah. Well, I, I think that's that's a great question, right? I think there's a lot of a lot of these um, AI evangelists. And I guess we should probably clarify generative AI. We're not talking about, you know, true artificial intelligence here. We're mm -hmm. talking about using, you know, these data pools to, um, you know, extrapolate uh, and create new new content, new answers and things. And I, I think there's a, you know, a lot of these AI evangelists suggest that we just need more data and then the the models will get more accurate. Um, but like somebody is, you know, like Gary Marcus has pointed out, um, you can throw all the data that you want into it. Um, you know, the, there's very simple reasoning that uh, these models fail at. For example, if you ask, um, you know, uh, the AI, you know, you program the AI with, uh, say, Susan Felder is Jesse Felder's mother. If you ask the AI, uh, who is, who is uh, Susan Felder's son? It will not be able to answer that question under any circumstance, right? So there, there are a lot of, you know, simple things like that that aren't solvable by more data there, um, you know, and, and so there's just, I think, fundamental problems with it. And Gary Marcus has, has pointed this out. It's not a matter of, of getting more data into the models to make them more accurate. There are fundamental problems that need to be solved here, and they're going to take a long time to solve. I think the best example of this is maybe the you know self-driving cars right we've seen tesla's autopilot has been in beta for over 10 years now right 
and they still haven't solved the fundamental problems that still plague the software. And now Tesla is being investigated for, you know, the, 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 a lot of the autopilot cars were crashing into emergency vehicles with their lights on on the side of the road that the software couldn't recognize. And, and so there's still, you know, a lot of these problems um, with, with self-driving cars that, that aren't solved um, by just doing more of the same. Um, they require major breakthroughs in terms of, um, you know, programming and technology and things that there, there's no sign that that those are going to arrive anytime soon. And so if it's taken, you know, and, and I think, that, you know, I took this again from from Gary's work, is that if it's taken self-driving cars, you know, 10 years to make as, as little progress as they've they have, you know, what it, it's probably a good, um, you know, uh, I guess, uh, representation of, of what we should expect from large language models and, mm -hmm. and these types of things is that, yeah, they're going to get better over time, but they're not going to solve these fundamental problems that make them literally unusable for so many different applications. Yeah. And I, I, I got to think too, with, um, uh, I can see in self-driving that sort of the more information you put into the system, the better it gets, right. Um, the more detail you add, the, the, the smarter the software gets where with these large language models, the bigger the information pools you get, it doesn't necessarily mean the quality is getting better. In fact, it may the quality may be getting worse. And in my mind, Reddit, I think, is a great example of that. Yeah, yeah there's a lot of content there. <laughs> yeah, and actually, I, it's horrible. <laughs> I've read, you know, certain AI experts suggest that, you know, once you introduce, um, you know, machine learning to these AI models that, you know, is based on the interactions that they have with humans, the, the value of, of the model itself deteriorates rapidly, right? So it actually doesn't improve based on the machine learning on the, you know, based on human interactions and things, it only gets worse. And so um, I think that's why we're seeing too the, the, the pricing for these older AI, you know, LLMs, the, these models, the, you know, chat GPT three and a half and, you know, whatever, the pricing is, is dropping, you know, dramatically is because the value of it um, is, is, uh, is just not there. Yeah. Um, they're, they're, it, it's difficult, difficult to find um, uses for it. I think, you know, the, the best use that they've found so far is, you know, in programming, right? If it can, if you can allow, uh, you know, you can give it a string of code and it can, uh, or, or tell you, you know, you can tell the AI what you want to program and it can write the code for you. That's fantastic. Um, you know, but, uh, you know, when you have, you uh, a technology that is prone to making errors at a, at a significant rate, right? And prone to hallucinations and these types of things. It, it just can't be used in, in mission critical ways that are fundamental to so many different industries. And so, you know, that, that's, a, that's a fundamental problem that still has yet to be solved. And I think is going to limit its adoption, at least in the short run. Okay, well, look, um, I, I'm not an AI expert and I'm, I'm, I'm certainly... I, I, I'm yeah. not either. In any uh, but I think strip. you're more informed than the average bear. Um, and, and I'm not here, neither are you, uh, I believe, uh, Jesse, to say that AI is, you know, a flash in the pan or that it's all hocus hokum or whatever, hokum. Um, but uh, I think what we're trying to say is, is we have markets that are priced to fantasy uh, being driven by a narrative that right now is, is assuming uh complete and utter sunshine and rainbows instant transformation and and we're just simply raising questions that say hey there are some pretty good arguments that suggest this is going to take a lot longer to manifest than perhaps the biggest cheerleaders are are assuming right now and therefore as an investor you have to proceed with caution if you're thinking of buying at today's prices um so you're nodding as i'm saying this uh, so let's let's now transition from okay financial assets likely overpriced right now given what we just talked about that in the short term given valuations likely overpriced perhaps in the longer term for your higher for longer inflation scenario that we talked about and higher for longer interest rates. Um, so you are saying, if I hear you correctly hey, it's time for investors to really start directing their attention away from financial assets toward hard assets, because those things are likely to perform better in this type of future uh, that you see. And they just happen to be really under-owned and really underpriced right now. Um, so 
let me let me set you loose on on that topic. Yeah. Well, I mean, just, you know, coming back to the AI thing and, and I'm not, you know, technophobe. I, you know, I, I think uh, I went to uh, when I was eight years old, I went to um, an Apple computer camp with, you know, the first Apple IIe and programming logo and things. And I've been a technophile my entire life. I'm really excited about the technology of AI and these types of things, but I think I'm just trying to be more realistic about what we can accomplish in the short run with a lot of these things. What I think we do know is that, uh, as the Financial Times points out, uh, Microsoft is opening a new data center globally every three days in order to meet the de demand for cloud and AI programming and all of these things. So the demand for energy is going to go through the roof as they continue, we continue to build data centers, and as the you know the the rest of the world continues to come into the developed world, um, and you know large uh, countries like India and China continue to uh, industrialize, um, that demand for energy is going to put a great strain on um, you know our our ability to to produce it. So, you know, I think natural gas is probably one of the areas that is, is, is just a real ripe opportunity, right? The price is really depressed in the short run because we've produced a ton of it. And, uh, you know, it's and the weather has been, you know, warmer than expected you know, the last couple of winters and things. And, uh, and we just have not, you know, supply and demand has been kind of upside down uh, for it. But longer term, I think the only way we're going to meet these energy needs is through uh, you know natural gas fired um, plants, uh, and I think you know the, so so things like like that um, are, are are things that appeal to me. Is that you know yes I mean I I I hope you know companies are able to monetize AI. I know that natural companies that produce natural gas there's going to be massive demand for their product for the next five ten years and and. Uh, uh, you know, my friends at Gehring and Rosenzweig have made a very compelling bull case for the price of energy today. I encourage people to check out their research. But I think generally, we've seen a dramatic underinvestment in commodities really since uh, 2014 oil price crashed. Um, and uh, we've seen, you know, these things go in, in cycles, right? And they're very closely uh, aligned with the capital cycle. When the oil, the last super cycle from 2002 to 2008, 11 or whatever, where we saw the oil price do really, really well, gold prices, silver prices do well, um, there resulted in a lot of overinvestment um, in, in the space. And then you know, after 2011, top in the gold price, 2014 crash in oil, investors got uh, once again enamored of you know, tech stocks and all that kind of stuff. And so capital flowed out of commodities into tech and communication services and things like this. Uh, but that dramatic underinvestment has resulted in um, really tight supplies um, and a lot of these things that are crucial to the green revolution, cru crucial to AI, crucial to crypto, if you want to you know, do crypto mining, and then just, um, just a, a growing uh, you know, global population. Um, you know, you need a lot of these things uh, in in supply, and we've just un massively underinvested in them. So I think that sets the stage for another super cycle in in these things. It's just a limited amount of supply paired with growing demand, and that's really the only area to come back to kind of corporate insider activity, where I've seen very bullish activity over the last you know several years. As you see, insiders continuing to buy. Um, you know, oil and gas, stocks of oil and gas producers, gold miners, these types of things. And, and I think it's a very clear sign that if there's any area where, where corporate insiders are bullish for the next several years, it's in, the, in these areas. Okay. Um, let me ask, so we're seeing um, energy perform really well. I believe it was the best performing sector in Q1 uh, this year. Um, and we've seen the price of the precious metals um, break out this year. It definitely break out in gold. Silver looks like it's finally starting to move as well, uh, but it's been lagging, obviously. Um, the, the precious metals miners are starting to show some life, but they have really lagged the prices of gold. Um, do you expect them to kind of slingshot here to catch up? I absolutely do. I think to me, the relative performance of the miners to the metal is a terrific sentiment signal. 
right? It's you look at like, um, there's a variety of things I look at for sentiment. One would be simply the Sprott Physical Gold and Silver Trust discount to its net asset value, right? This thing just owns physical gold and silver mm -hmm. and it trades at a 5% discount to the assets in storage, right? right? That tells you all you need to know. It's like, wait, where else in the world could I go buy precious metals at a 5% discount to market value? I, and I'm not, I have nothing to do with Sprott. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm not promoting them. I don't get paid by them or anything like that, but I'm just suggesting that when an asset trades at a persistent discount to its net asset value, it's a, it's a sign that investors have zero interest there, negative interest there. You see that in ETF flows, right? In the, you know, flows out of the GLD and things like that that have been dramatic. Uh, and so the fact that the gold price has been able to break out, even as, um, you know, these investors have been very bearish uh, in terms of their behavior towards them, I think is a very uh, positive thing. Uh, pointing to the su sustainability of the, the breakout. But the, the relative underperformance of the miners is the same thing, right? Investors don't have any desire to go buy gold miners. To me, that's just a points to the, you know, the, the bearish sentiment towards the group broadly. So, um, and look, I'm not trying to, to get a bunch of people to throw their money in these highly volatile um, and, and, and speculative, for the most part, stocks, um, if you move away from the, the, the really big majors. Um, but, you know, it sounds like you're saying, Hey, you know, if you want to follow the Warren Buffett, you know, be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when folks are fearful, uh, money is still somewhat fearful of, uh, this, uh, precious metals mining sector. One of the few sectors that, that folks aren't greedy and haven't been greedy in uh, of late. Uh, but maybe time might be running out because the, the metal prices are on the move. And one of the things that, that, people say about the mining complex, and I'd like to get your reaction to this, is, you know, when it moves, it moves really big. And it, it does so largely for two reasons. One, the miners are a leveraged play on the price of the metals. And that's just how it works. Their, their costs are relatively stable. But if the price of the metal moves, that just all immediately goes to the bottom line, right? So they, they, they get a, a leveraged um, uh, impact on their profits. Um, but also, this sector is not that big. Right. And Wall Street, you know, loves nothing more than momentum. And if it starts seeing that money's being made in the sector, it'll flow into it. And it won't take that much capital flowing into the sector to send some of these prices a lot higher just just because there's not that many companies and they're all pretty small. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with all of that. I think that, you know, that that does explain a lot of it is when money is just flowing into the U.S. equity indexes, you know, none of that is going into new Madison, essentially, right? right? None of that's going into into Barrick or, you know, in, in any of these names because they're so insignificant in terms of the, the indexes. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it will take a, uh, a shift in people wanting to own alternative assets right and people and so i think that you know it it, it goes into this kind of uh, ai mindset you know when, when these ai stocks are going to the moon and you can buy zero data expiry options and, and make two thousand percent as you know gungeon um you know Banerjee did wall street journal reporter you know and become addicted to options trading <laughs> uh you know on uh, there's there, i mean no reason to go look for things that might protect me uh, against inflation, things that I mean, you know, another thing my friend Calum Thomas has pointed out is that just uh, allocation to defensive assets is at like essentially record lows right now, right? Nobody wants to even own healthcare and staples and these types of things. And so um, it's going to take a change in mindset. And that's, you know, kind of more of a bear market attitude, I think, where people start losing interest and becoming disappointed in the returns from these semiconductor stocks and some of these other high flyers. And then say, okay, wait a second. I'm not. We're not in a bull market environment anymore. We're not in a uh, a low interest rate environment anymore. We're in an, in a new new world. And what does this new world require? How do I make money in this new world? And that you know, it's going to be how do I protect myself against inflation? I got to own some precious metals. I got to own some commodities. I got to own these things. And I think that with the recent price action, it's been very encouraging in that regard that we're maybe at the early stage of kind of that type of an epiphany among investors. Okay. So, so again, your, um, your view in the, this commodity space, you used the term earlier, super cycle. Um, this is not just a, a rotation that you expect to happen this year that's going to kind of come and go you're talking about something that's much more secular. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, if you look at energy in, in uh, 21 and 22, you know, it was the best performing sector for those those years. It was just last year that everybody else said, oh, OK, it's all done. It's over. Right. We don't need to own these things anymore. Um, and so but, but that 21 and 22 time period, like I said, is, is probably just the early innings. Same thing with copper prices. Right. Um, I think everybody has, you know, over the last year gave up on commodities, gave up on a lot of these things generally. But um, I think they're just, you know, have taken a break. The last year has essentially been a break in the middle of a much bigger move. OK. Uh, and you mentioned uh, copper. So you've been talking about energy and precious metals and obviously the companies that extract and refine them. Um, do you feel similarly about the base metals like copper and, and the other industrial metals and the uh, the softs, you know, the agricultural commodities? I, you know, I, I do, because I think, you know, in, in a commodity super cycle, it's driven by dynamics that should, you know, float all, all boats. But generally, I'm focused, um, you know, my money's focused pretty much into the energy space and the precious metal space, specifically because that's where I see um, the most compelling, like I said, uh, insider activity, which is kind of one of the primary ways that I, I evaluate uh, opportunities. And so um, I, I have, haven't have seen the uh, type of insider activity in other areas that would kind of get me interested in from uh, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, equities in that area. Okay. All right. Well, look, um, we're going to have to start wrapping up here. Um, Jesse, it's been wonderful. Um, I, I know we had talked before we turned the uh, the camera on that we wanted to, to get into sort of the central banking world for a bit, but it would be too unfair to ask you uh, to do that with just a minute or two left here. So um, we'll just have to have you come back on and we'll, we'll dive into that. Um, uh, but uh, um, before we go, perhaps the most important question, which is for folks that have really enjoyed this discussion and would like to follow you in your work, where should they go? Um, you've mentioned my Twitter a couple times already. I appreciate the plug. It's just at Jesse Felder. And uh, I share a lot of uh, you know what I'm reading and stuff there. Um, but I also write at uh, you know a weekly market comment at thefelderreport.com. I also put out a weekly blog post there with uh, typically five of the most interesting things that I found during the week. Uh, it can be a, an article. Uh, chart, um, you know, some type of a stat or something, but that's just, you know, free to subscribe to on my website. Okay, great. All right. Well, um, Jesse, when we edit this, when I edit this, I'll put up the links to those prominently on the screen so folks know exactly where to go. And folks, the links will be in the description below this video as well. Um, <clears throat> all right, uh, Jesse, as we wrap up um, in about 30 seconds, I'm going to ask you uh, the final question, which is, um, What's a, a non-money related investment that you would encourage folks to consider uh, adopting in their lives? While you chew on that, just real quick, folks, if you've enjoyed this conversation with Jesse and would like to have him come back on the program um, as soon as he's got something you know, in his uh, outlook that he thinks is important to share, please let him know that by hitting the like button and clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. Um, and uh, uh, just a reminder that um, uh, on my Substack, uh, which everybody who watches this uh, this YouTube channel should subscribe to, because uh, you get uh, alerted to you know every new interview that we do, uh, plus a lot of other free content. Um, but the premium subscribers get my um, Adam's Notes write ups uh, to these interviews. Uh, these are like my Cliff Notes versions. Um, and if you want to get those, including my write up of this one with Jesse, uh, just go to adamtaggart.substack.com. And lastly, as you look forward to uh, considering how to navigate this new future that, that Jesse sees coming, um, uh, you know, there's a fair amount of uncertainty. If we are going into a more secularly high inflation world, that's a playbook that most investors and most of Wall Street, uh, it's terra incognita to them. That, that just hasn't happened in their careers. Uh, so um, if you um, are looking for help with that, and I suggest, as I always do, that most people watching this video should get that help. Um, highly recommend that you work under the guidance of a good professional financial advisor, uh, but one that takes into account all the macro issues that Jesse and I have talked about here and that the many guests who appear on this channel and I discuss. Um, and when you kind of put that requirement on the universe of financial advisors, it actually shrinks an awful lot. But if you've got one of the good ones and they are putting together a good portfolio strategy for you and executing it for you, great, stick with them. They are very rare. They are worth their weight in gold. 
Um, but if you don't have one, you'd like a second opinion from one, consider scheduling a free consultation with one of the financial advisors that Thoughtful Money endorses. To do that, just fill out the short form at thoughtfulmoney.com. Only takes you a couple seconds, and these consultations are totally free. There's no commitment to work with these guys. It's just a free public service they offer to help as many people as possible position as prudently as possible today in advance of what might be coming down the road, especially uh, the types of things that Jesse has forecasted here. All right, Jesse, thanks so much. Um, we're here at that last question. Um, what non-money related investment would you encourage folks to consider adopting in their lives? Well, it's it's interesting you use the word adopt because I know during the pandemic, there was a big boom in adopting animals from shelters and, and dogs. Specifically, a lot of those were you know, given back. I think that yeah. a frustration, sadly. Um, but it's something that's been a passion of mine really since I was in high school. And I got my first dog, a black lab, um, who was, it was just a problem puppy. And my parents, uh, <clears throat> uh, got me some lessons for you know, obedience. And since then I've had a passion for dog training. And so over the last couple of years, um, I, you know, two years ago, I got an Australian shepherd puppy, who is literally just, you know, the most eager, smart, uh, mm -hmm. you know, just give him a job and he's happy as a clam. And so it's been a real challenge for me to keep him busy enough and come up with, with things to, and so it's investing time in him and learning new tricks and doing, you know, playing Frisbee and all these kinds of things has been really a joy in my life. And so um, I encourage people who, you know, who have wanted to own a dog or have owned a dog and maybe you've gotten frustrated. I mean, there's so many great tools and tips, especially on YouTube, you can find, um, you know, for, for learning how to, 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 to train your dog. And there's a few things that I've found more rewarding. That is great. I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up. And yeah, and it's, it's a tragedy how many uh, animals have been given back uh, that were, you know, COVID puppies and kittens and whatnot. Uh, and, and sadly, you know, a lot of them end up getting uh, put down if they, they can't get owners for them. Um, so there's a huge amount of animals out there that, that need a good place. Um, it, it's, it's, I, I have two labs right now that are purchased from breeders. And the only reason why I felt comfortable doing that at this stage of my life is I grew up in a, in a household with gazillions of animals, all of whom were rescues. Um, and we had dogs, we had cats, we had birds, we had swans, we had, uh, we had an opossum for many years. <laughs> um, so, uh, I, it, it, your, your concerns are near and dear to my heart, Jesse, for just the good we can do in the world with these animals and then dogs specifically. And I've, I've talked about this, uh, in this section of, of one of the previous, um, uh, videos I did where somebody brought up something dog related. Um, do dogs are just different. And I know I'm going to get a lot of pushback from cat owners and, and other <laughs> pet owners. but but as I, I talked about in the book sapiens um you know they, they chronicle how humans domesticated animals and we domesticated there's a number there's the first animal we domesticated like thirty five thousand years ago and it was like another fifteen thousand or twenty thousand years before we domesticated the second animal like we have yeah. just been co-evolving with dogs way longer than any species and that yeah. bond it's 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 such a um a symbiotic bond and, and and dogs really can just bring such a great quality of life to us. So anyways, yes, to go out there and, and rescue, you know, some of these poor dogs that got handed back and have them enrich your life uh, and figure out how to be a better owner to them in the way that you're talking about by going and learning those, you know, teaching tools and stuff like that. I, I can't agree more. Yeah, it's absolutely been, you know, for the last couple of years, it's been a lifesaver for me. So I, I highly recommend it. All right, my friends. All right. Well, look, Thank you so much. As always, Jesse, you never disappoint. These are wonderful conversations. Really look forward to having you back on the program. Um, but thanks so much for coming on. Always great to talk with you, Adam. Thanks again for having me back on. Appreciate it. All right, buddy. Thanks. And everyone else, thanks so much for watching.